like you, Con. I'm, I'm talking with people about really hard things. And um, then I, I start talking with Vicky about this and how kind of tied up in knots I'm feeling. And am I actually doing anything useful? And is this safe? And all that kind of stuff. And, uh, and then we start having conversations about safety. And um, really, really um, helped me to figure out a better way of operating, or what I hoped was a better way of operating there. So because a lot of the people I was seeing had no, had no safety. So we'd have a conversation about hard things. They go away and they had no safe place to go, like really no safe place to go. So then it became, okay, what do we do instead? Well, then we try to create safety in the community by doing a bunch of different things. So it became a community development project. And um, that, that shift, I think, is absolutely essential. So then we do things like um, have community bingos and community dinners. And uh, we have public conversations about safety. Not violence, you can't talk about violence, but you can talk about safety in a lot of places. Uh, in a town where the women's shelter was actually the library, they had an activist librarian who for 20 years was secretly had a women's shelter in her house. And uh, so that, that's kind of how things roll up there. And so that, that's one of many conversations I personally have had with Vicky, and I know you have had your own conversations with Vicky, that have been just immensely helpful and life-changing. And it's so fantastic that you're here to give us a talk. So Thank you, Emily. <laughs> Well, morning. I'm a little bit nervous, uh, discomforted in a good way. This is, uh, I'm absolutely humbled that you would invite me to speak um, here and that you have created space for that. And I want to really acknowledge Kathy Richardson and Alan Wade and Linda Coates for the work that has so backed me up. And also, in particular, Kathy and Alan have always made space for me and my work, which is not about me, but is about always making room for social justice and, and direct action activists, which are is a kind of activism that's actually not always, well, we kind of fart in church. <laughs> <laughs> the people who fart in church are welcome to us. And I, and I really, that's a huge thing to do, so I want to really appreciate that. I, I, um, my voice is going to be shaky, because it always is, because uh, um, these things really matter to me and to all of us. That's why we're here together. Um, but uh, Omar Kadar uh, was out on bail yesterday, and uh, just seeing him on the television and having the solidarity of Linda and Shelley stand with me watching that was so moving, and took me back to when I saw um, Angela, when I saw Nelson Mandela in Oakland. I had left South Africa when he was on Robben Island. We thought he was going to die in jail. So these are the moments. Um, Omar Kadar was um, the longest serving Western citizen in Guantanamo Bay. Our government is the only Western government that didn't bring their citizens out of there. And he's been tortured there since he was 15, more than half of his life. Tortured by people trained by the APA, the American, uh, members of the American Psychological Association. So this is inextricably linked to our work. Like there's always these threads of connection, but I just, what a celebratory, fabulous thing to see him walking and how do we all do the next things? Because we know this young man will be under total scrutiny and Islamophobia to try to criminalize him. And we must all be in solidarity with him and take real actions for his safety, right? And to honor him. So I just wanted to start with that. Um, I have, um, oh, I was going to uh, maybe office talk. Um, I have a website. There's no t-shirts or CDs for sale. <laughs> it's not a capitalist project. Um, it's very tricky, www.vickyreynolds.ca. But because I made my name V-I-K-K-I -K -K uh, in an effort to not be Victoria, you have to kind of spell it right or you won't get it. Um, why I'm telling you that is I'm going to reference widely, which I always do, not to show that I'm a whizzy academic, although I'm a pretty whizzy academic. But um, we reference widely so that we show these, these ideas come from various domains of practice. They're not from psychology necessarily. There are, there are other domains of practice that we want to weave in. And also um, to show people the histories of ideas, that these are definitely not my ideas. I've spent some time putting some things together. My work is profoundly collaborative. Um, and so, you know, it's been inspired by activists and all kinds of folks that I've worked with who've challenged me, questioned me, um, and, and brought me forward through, through a critique that it sometimes was from people's just anger and pain because I did things that were disappearing and hard. I mean, I'm a very failed activist. <laughs> And so it's through those learnings, you know, I think about the transgender and queer community who've taught me so much. I clinically supervised the Katherine White Holman um, 
Catherine White Bowman, the panicking uh, wellness center, which is a free uh, gender variant clinic in East Vancouver. And I was been saying to some folks like, I've been a clinical supervisor for a really long time. Every time I have a meeting with this group of folks, people need to critique me out loud uh, because otherwise other five people will email me that I've done something wrong because they're all so tender and caring for me. And it's like what they need, to, like, I was like, you know what, we just need to do it out loud because you need to know that every, someone's already got this. You know what I mean? And this is because I'm on the edge of my knowing, moving into new territory, right? Where it's not about getting it right, it's about trying to be accountable and move forward in a way that doesn't replicate oppression. So I honor all the people, people of color, queer and trans folks, activists, poor people, um, a lot of straight white men in the downtown east side who are like homeless and forgotten, you know, because they've been criminalized and institutionalized. All of these groups of folks um, have educated me at my benefit and at their cost, eh? This is not innocent work that we do. It's always on the backs of others when we learn things. So I just want to say while I'm up here and I'm okay with that, it's no, I don't stand alone and I know I'm on the shoulders of many. So I reference widely and I'm going to just tell you there's a couple articles in particular. One is called An Ethical Stance for Justice Doing. Um, and one is called Resisting Burnout with Justice Doing. Those, those articles are on my website and don't read them, but the reference lists are good. So everything you're looking, everything I reference here is pretty much going to be in there. Um, so I hope that's going to be useful. Um, yeah, I'm missing a little bit. So my hope is that I, um, that I, my intention is to be decolonizing and uh, to have an anti-oppressive stance. And a lot of people are talking now about centering indigeneity and having indigenous knowledge at the center. I don't use that language because I'm just nowhere near that in the process. Like. I am still decolonizing myself to such an extent that I would just be taking on rhetoric of activism that I'm not actually embodied. So that's why I still say that I'm actually working to decolonize myself and my family, my community. Um, and as Andrea, Andrea Smith says, you know, if we're really going to decolonize, we are going to have to dismantle our state. I'm hoping to do that too. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I see my work very much, oh, you got to see that. Oh, wait, no, there's something that's supposed to show up there. But it didn't. Okay, well, there's a picture behind this. Yeah, you're not going to get it. Okay. Uh, um, it's uh, spray paint with a Canada flag with the maple leaf upside down. And it was on the street and it says, Oh Canada, our home on native land. And I love that because it's like you don't need to have a PhD in critical linguistics. You don't need to study everything from Linda Coates, although you should, uh, <laughs> to get that, you know what, here's a young Aboriginal person has held up a sign like this. They've got all the analysis that they need. That's a critical inversion of language, right? And so it's happening on so many fronts. So I take my work as an imperfection project, and that's not to um, get myself off the hook for being accountable for what I say, but it's imperfect because we haven't delivered on a socially just society. So I believe none of us can actually be enacting or living in just relationships in a society that would leave Omar Khadr as a, like a critically injured youth shot and take him to a place where he's actually tortured for the next decade and a half with a government that knew about that and did nothing. Like, how can we say, how can we say we're enacting justice when this is going on, right? Uh, Adorno said, um, you know, there is no art after Auschwitz. Like, there are things that need to interrupt our lives. And so it's imperfect because this is where we are in this moment in time. And, uh, and I'm hoping that together, collaboratively, we're going to be moving into the next new territories together. And there's many of my teachers are in this room for that. Um, this is Sekna Hamid Beckett, who I adore, and why wouldn't you? She's a woman of bodacious brain, and um, she's in Sydney, Australia. And uh, Sekna and I have uh, co-written a, a, a chapter for a book that this, uh, that this work is coming from. She's very much on my solidarity team, as a, in particular as a white person and I'm Irish Catholic, just a boot, you know, be a Christian too. Um, just uh, some of the locations that I hold have blinded me and invisibilized me to some of the things I need to see, and Sekna is a woman of color from um, our refugee migrant experience and uh, from Muslim culture. And so she's, you know, together we've been able to make way more things visible to each other. So she's very much in my solidarity team for this, and if we could have worn her over, we would have. <laughs> but um, yeah, and also her community uh, in Sydney is under extreme attacks from Islamophobia from a very hateful fascist state eh, in Australia. and. When um, Jeff Smith was showing yesterday, um, P 
people's responses to the shooting of black men by the police in the United States, which is many of us are seeing these, these are lynchings, but they're, they're more than lynchings because lynchings were illegal. This is political violence because it's exonerated by the state, so it moves up to this other category. We got to grab that we can't just point our fingers at the Americans, but graft ourselves into these territories and these attacks, right? And where Sekne is in Australia, you know, having uh, boy, young men, children who are brown, who are read as Muslim, is a is a precarious life. And so that's some of the territory she walks on that I don't walk that, okay? And I'm on territory, I know, where I live in East Vancouver, that I walk easily in places where, I know as a, even as a woman, um, I am safer than any Aboriginal man in that territory. Like, these are these are the realities. So just to, second is one of the people who keeps me on top about this kind of stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what I'm gonna, what I'm gonna talk about is, um, how is it that we can actually invite a hopeful skepticism to ourselves? There's been an awful lot of uh, work done and good work at people's intentions and hopes and real things that we're doing that are moving towards a socially just world and social just interactions with other folks. Um, so how do we actually know that our work is enacting our ethics of social justice? And what I'm going to invite is a humble critique. These are not rhetorical questions. These are questions I also need to struggle with and cannot answer. Many are recursive questions, meaning they just bring in more questions and you don't answer the bastards. It just keeps, it's exhausting. But uh, you know what? People always say, oh my God, Vicki, if you're going to hold this many, this much reflexive questions, it's exhausting. And I'm like, it is. But the alternative is being lazy or having things simpler to the extent where I'm going to replicate oppression, and that's paralyzing. So I, I'm going to go with being tired instead of being unable to move, right? So here's the domains I'm kind of talking about. Like, how do we resist and respond? to power and privilege, neutrality, and taking overt positions for justice doing, white supremacy and colonization, social control or social change. Are we doing social control? Are we doing social change? Um, competition and other affronts to our solidarity, and academia and justice doing. What is the tension in academia when we're making claims that what we're doing there is justice doing? Um, this work is uh, centered for me on standing on the shoulders of many theorists. Uh, not much of it's actually got to do with therapy, really. Um, women of color feminism, critical race theory and decolonizing practice. I have Ngugi Watiango there, and I met Ngugi Watiango, um, which was like just an amazing moment in my life. And Alan Wade gave me an Ngugi book once. Like, <laughs> there's all these points of connection. So Ngugi uh, Watiango's work around decolonizing the mind has been really influential for me, his other writings as well. But uh, he was doing this stuff like in the 60s and 70s, you know, where I didn't, you know, that's where I first learned these words. It was actually from him, and I didn't quite know what it meant. Uh, and not that I've got it now. Um, yeah. Um, Bell Hooks, feminism is for everybody. This is really important to me. Feminism is for women, men, and trans people, and gender variant folks. It's not the domain of women. The other thing that Bell says that I really appreciate and try to act with is men can enact feminism. You know, and women can enact patriarchy, right? Gender variant people are enacting all these things too. It's not about our gender location, right? If feminism is for everybody, then we need to actually look at the actions and the impacts of our behavior, what they're what they're doing in the real world. Uh, we're not safe because we're in this category of woman, like I was saying. So that to me come, came from Bell Hooks as did much. And also, you know, this one book, Feminism for Real, but what I'm talking about is just a critical um, approach to feminism from women of color in particular and colonized women, um, also institutionalized women, you know. Um, and so these things really shook up, these guys really shook up a lot of what I thought about social justice. Um, and as well, I'm informed by, I'm not sure what's happening, get a PowerPoint. <coughs> That's a picture of the Women's Memorial March, by queer theory, critical trans theory, and an anti authoritarian and direct action activism. I'll tell you what I mean by that. Um, from queer theory and trans theory, this is where, um, in particular, critical trans theory, I'm thinking about Dean Spade uh, wrote a book uh, called Normal Life. And Dean Spade, one of the things Dean Spade says that I think is so beautiful is, it's the folks in the margins who are in the margins of oppression who create, who have struggles and make more space for all of us in the center, right? So for me, you know, queer politics and people taking on the state and you know, when I was in the United States, challenges um, against the AIDS epidemic, uh, because, you know, in 1990, the president, of the, even though there was an epidemic and many people were dying of AIDS, the president of the United States had not said the word AIDS. Well, um, 
the people who took to the street were queer folks, um, gender variant folks, a lot of drag queens. You know, those are the people that spearheaded those movements in terms of ACT UP and Queer Nation. And things got better for everybody because AIDS is everybody's issue. But we were seeing it as an issue of, quote, gay men and IV drug users. That's just an example how when, you know, these folks on the margins of power struggle and make things better, but it gets better for all of us. So it's always on the backs of others. And that's why we need to be in more solidarity to have it not be just that way. That was really important to me. Um, and also, you know, teaching me ideas around heteronormativity, which we had kind of named uh, the other day. Um, heteronormativity being the idea that to be straight and in a couple that's not in an open relationship and have children and buy a house, that this is normal. And it's not just about gender and it's not just about sexual orientation, it's also about your relationship to capitalism. And it's about, this is a normal life, and everybody outside of heteronormativity has to explain themselves. And they have to explain themselves on every domain of living. Okay? And then also cis-normativity. I'm a cisgendered person, meaning my biology, my way I perform myself, and the way you read me all says woman. That means, so there's a connection there. Transgender and gender variant um, is where there's a diversity of things going on. And so when, you, when you're cis when we're with cis normativity, we're just making assumptions that those two bathrooms out there serve everybody, but they don't, right? And it's the plumbing of the bathroom, not the plumbing of us as people that needs to be scrutinized. So we're replicating these things all the time. It's, it's, and this cis normativity and uh, heteronormativity is so, you know, the water's invisible to the fish. It's where we swim. It's new territory for many of us. We gotta break out. We're invisibilizing people and not making room for them. And this is, this is the stuff that props up heteropatriarchy. It's not just patriarchy, but it's a patriarchy that's actually heteronormative and uh, connected to those kind of things. So there's many great writings and uh, things that you could look at for that if you're on the edge of your knowing around that. But these things have really mattered to me. Um, and one of the things that I'm really committed to and trying to be a better ally around is trans inclusivity. I work a lot of places and have been a lot of places and consult a lot of places where people talk about being trans inclusive. But I think what we're at, if we have a hermeneutics of suspicion, if we're in a hopeful skepticism, I don't think we're trans-inclusive. I think we're trans-tolerant. And when trans-tolerance gets equated as trans-inclusivity, we do stuff like leave the bathrooms binary. you got a men and women's bathroom out there. It doesn't reflect who we are, who we want to be in the space we want to make, right? So those are, these are some of the things that I think about. In terms of um, anti-authoritarian and direct action activism, I'm connected with a group No One Is Illegal which is a migrant justice group, led mostly, uh, you know, there's not leaderships in these collective things, by minoritized racialized people. Um, and their direct action activism uh, against this state and against um, uh, massive deportations of people of color um, has been illuminating to me because they're, um, they're uh, not, they don't engage in criminal actions and yet they're taking on the state in these direct action ways that are really thoughtful and useful and accountable to the people they're trying to serve. So it's this kind of, these histories also act up, like all of these histories of direct action activism where people take positions that are something other than a candlelight vigil or writing a letter. Those are good tactics, it's just we need to examine all of our tactics. They're never enough, right? We, we write letters, have candlelight vigils, and take to the streets, and don't attack the tactics of others. We got to be really careful about our solidarity for that. During the Olympics, a lot of people critiqued the black bloc tactics of breaking a window at Hudson's Bay, but I didn't see a whole lot of people pissed and incensed that Nahar Harriet Nahani, an elder, was killed by the RCMP defending the land trying to stop the Olympics coming. So there was outrage over a window, but not over the state. You know, the state uh, arrested Harriet Nahani, put her in jail. She they let her out of prison to die. She didn't get to die in prison, but. Um, that she was a, a fatality of the Olympics. And so when you're worried about a window being broken and calling it violence when actually it's property damage, and you're equating that with the death of an Aboriginal woman who's an elder and a residential school survivor, we have a problem, right? So these are, this is for me, these educations come from this direct action activism. Okay. Um, so to have a decolonizing and anti-oppression stance, we need to reflect, as Susan Sontag talks about, on how the suffering others is systematically mapped onto the privileges we hold, right, as helping professionals. And these privileges are often invisibilized by the obscurification of power. Um, I was saying yesterday, some of the reason we don't know these things is not that we're stupid or we didn't take enough courses, we're actually being lied to. There is an apparatus to invisibilize power, right? So you're not stupid for not knowing these things. You're, we, we are actually being lied to and being held back from knowing things, right? Um, 
So, but you know, if we have this hopeful skepticism, you know, when I go into teams, I'm hopefully skeptical. Everybody tells me they're client-centered, and I hope they are, but I'm very skeptical that they are, and then I want them to show me how everything you're doing is actually centering clients then. When people tell me they're doing harm reduction, like, that's cool. What harms are you reducing? Right? Like, let's actually take a look. Just as activists have to look at our tactics continually, I'm trying to bring this kind of uh, useful way of being into, into therapy. So we need to be doing... So we, if we look at our actions, we might find out that we're actually doing things we hadn't intended. And so we need to be really careful about these kind of things. Um, and addressing our privilege is really discomforting. I'm a little bit discomforted right now because I hope I got all that kind of right enough. Because <laughs> you can't get it right because we don't have a socially just world, right? But this discomfort is both predictable and necessary, right? And that's what um, Kumashiro says, and I like that. It's not something to be mitigated or get out of the way. We're going to be uncomfortable. Let's sit with that. Let's develop a capacity to do more than tolerate discomfort or ameliorate it, you know what I mean? Um, and also these ideas of... Um, that if we're unsettled, we're actually more open to being accountable that something's actually not going wrong. So here's some questions that I'm asking myself. Um, what are the intersections of my own power and privilege with disadvantage? And how am I accountable for my unearned privileges? How do I resist positioning myself in locations of disadvantage when I'm serving suffering others? I'm a working class person. And you know when I, when I meet with a person who's uh, queer or transgender, Immediately, you know, I want to be a working class person, a woman. I don't want to be a white person and a straight person. Like, I don't want to meet people in my site of privilege. I try to locate myself in my disadvantage, right? It's a tactic we have, and we got to interrupt that and see it coming. Am I starting to locate myself as, oh, yeah, but I'm a girl. Stuff for us, too, as opposed to tell me, uh, let me make space for your experience, as uncomfortable that's going to be for me to hear, because you're mapping your reality onto my privilege, and I'm right here facing this, right? How, do I, how am I responding to power both moment to moment and contextually in this interaction? And I think that Linda and Alan have been talking about that consistently in this workshop. How am I resisting righteousness, posturing, and double comfort of naming privilege righteously but doing nothing to mitigate it? You know, so you say, um, you know, if I'm in a room of First Nations folks at Watson Lake or something, like, I realize I'm, you know, from colonizing culture and I'm white. So I'm like, okay, I've named that and I have the righteous fabulousness of feeling like I named my privilege, and then I'd be a white person all over the day. <laughs> Take all the space and stuff, right? Do you know what I mean? That's that double comfort Heron talks about, that you, you name your privilege and you feel righteously cool about that, but the end of, all I have to do is name it, we're done, check. It's like we actually have to, then we have to make space and actually act differently, right? Um, and how do I invite and embrace that discomfort? Yeah? And who's in solidarity with me? Who's going to hold me up to do this? Who are my people? A lot of my people are in this room, man. I've got a lot of revolutionary love for people in this room. Who holds us up collectively in our organizations? These kind of things. And how are we holding? How are we holding ourselves accountable to transgressions of power? How are clients invited in safe enough and trustworthy enough ways to name transgressions? What structures and practices are in place to make this naming possible and and useful consistently and predictably across time? That's a hell of a question. I, I don't. I don't have an answer to that one, so I'll go on. Um, Resisting neutrality and taking overt positions for justice doing. We have to remind ourselves um, that uh, there's, a duty, um, there's a duty for us as the witness of suffering to actually do something about it. Our, our professions all teach objectivity and neutrality. It's kind of required. It's in the code of ethics often, and I think it's totally unethical. I'm, I'm not neutral about the rape of children. right? I'm not neutral about um, the political torture that Omar Qadar suffered. I'm against it. I'm not neutral at all about these things. So we need to be taking some overt positions. And it feels uncomfortable, yeah, but we need to kind of do that. Um, and as, you know, Linda Tawai Smith says, you know, it's cool to be in a conversation where you deconstruct things and take things apart. But Linda Tawai Smith in um, Decolonizing Methodology says, it doesn't prevent anybody from dying. we got to do the next thing. There are limits to talk therapy. There's limits to language, right? Yeah. So... Um, and simultaneously, I think we have to be, we have to be um, careful and critical of how our well-intentioned activism can actually be used to justify and strengthen structures we oppose. Like in the feminist movement against violence, we did a lot of activism against gang rape, and what ended up is the cops got a gang rape squad. So like a whole bunch of resources went to have more policing. Most of, and uh, and those, those resources you know, did not go to rape crisis centers, right? And uh, many of the people who are... Uh, women, trans women, and gender variant folks that I work with 
would never call the police. That money just went out of their universe because they're not people who would assume when you call the police that their first thought is your safety. That's a real point of privilege to think when you call the cops, the first thing you're thinking about is, are you okay? What can we do for you? That's not what many people think in this world, right? Um, and these are the kind of questions I ask myself and don't answer, because they're not going to answer um, about that. So despite our overt ethical stances for justice doing, what positions are we not taking? And what are we being silent about? What promotes this silence? Ignorance, tiredness, discomfort, a lack of moral courage, not knowing what to say or how to say it because you want it to be heard as a critique and not an attack? Um, or you're afraid for your career or advancement? Those things can silence us. Or we can be silenced as acts of resistance, right? Histories of being unsupported, being victims of backlash, a lack of allies, having precarious employment, you know, the unsafety as opposed to discomfort. It's not always discomfort. Sometimes you're actually unsafe, right? A lack of privilege power and solidarity. How can we take up silence as resistance? And how can we discern when it's safe enough and we're required to speak and when we need to build more solidarity as a tactic to make it more effective, right? And how are the politics of neutrality and objectivity mapped onto the legacies of white supremacy and colonization in the helping professions? How are professional objectivity and neutrality connected to other sites of oppressions and exclusion like homophobia, transphobia, ableism, and stigma against mental illness? So the other thing I, oh, I didn't give you guys that. No, wait, should you have? Ha. Yeah, I said that. Okay, we're going to go here. <laughs> this got me, this, this technology stuff's great, but I'm like, okay, naming and responding to white supremacy and colonialism. So Euro and Anglo colonialism in Canada and in Australia, right? originated in political violence against indigenous people in attempts to steal and exploit their land, wealth, resources, and children, and place them in a class of servitude. That's from Kathy Richardson. Words such as torture, genocide, racism, and white supremacy are all omitted from any discourse from the government describing the deliberate violence against indigenous people. When we were talking about putting words to deeds, right, as Coates and Wades would say, these are the words that need to be put to the deed of what gets called residential schools, and they're, and they're totally absent. Um, and Gord Hill talks about um, the stages of colonialism in Canada around invasion, occupation, genocide, and assimilation, right? The residential schools, everybody that didn't die of the genocide needed to be assimilated, and that's what residential schools were for, to kill the Indian and the child. So between 84 to 70% of the children were sexually abused. In some schools, that number is as high as 100%. The non-sexual physical abuse was barbaric and indicates the violence was systemic and deliberate. And that's what makes it political violence sanctioned by the government and not just a bunch of priests who lost the plot. Again, that's another lie. We were, there's these guys who are rapists. It's like, and that's not like that. And it's like that. It's both, right? Um, in Australia, they have the stolen generation. So these, you know, I, know, I remember when I put the dots together in New Zealand, Aotearoa, Australia, Canada, and the United States have similar history to this. It's, it was systemic. It's the way colonization works. It wasn't just a bad idea. It wasn't, as the Harper said, a harmful history. It wasn't a harmful history, man, right? Um, so in response to this, um, and the truth and reconciliation pro process in Canada, we had the non-apology by the government, where they didn't name any of those things. And if you haven't read Linda Coates and Alan Wade's article on the non-apology, it's on the uh, response-based website. It's a fabulous discourse analysis of what that apology was and why it was not an apology and what would actually be required. So that's something I think about. Um, and I like this idea about, Kathy gave us a, a book called Unsettling the Settler. You know, we need to be, and those of us who are settlers need to be unsettled about this. And the helping professions are inextricably linked with these violent histories and these current oppressions and practices we practice within these contexts of colonization. So a decolonizing ethical stance requires an inquiry into the relationship of therapy, therapy and community work with white supremacy, right? And also the profession and professionals' participation in colonization. Um, what Fanon talks about that's phenomenal to me, that because he wrote this the year, I, it was published the year I was born, or maybe it was the year I was 62. And he talked about we pathologize colonized people. Think of all the ways we talk about indigenous people in our thing multi-generational grief, multi-generational whatever, right? Um, we don't talk about it as we stole your children and that, and we continue to do that. That you were, you know. Um, and what Fanon said is we pathologize the colonized, and he said, you know what? There's a psychopathology of the colonization. It's the colonizer who's actually the person not behaving well here, or the person not well. And that 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 was 
You know, I didn't get this book referenced in any of my undergrad, masters, or PhD courses. Uh, Fanon is another person we're lied to about. You have to invisibilize Fanon, he's so important, eh? Where, where did we not get this? Um, the other thing is Todd and Wade wrote a lovely article that was alluded to in this conference already around psycholonization and the interface between the practices of colonization, which I was just laying out, is so structural and uh, premeditated, and the practices of psychology, and they fit together so beautifully, you know, that you guys sat down and busted out an article about it, and it probably was hard to write it, but it wasn't hard to put it together in terms of the ideas, eh, Alan? Um, and then Imelda McCarthy, who is from the, the fifth province that Cheryl Henry was talking about yesterday, talked about benevolent colonization. Isn't that an icky feeling? It makes me want to take a shower. You know, that the charity, that for their own good, the, you know, the colonization that happens um, with the, quote, best of intentions, and how insidiously violent that is as well. Um, but I, um, Sekna and I come from different migration paths. So I'm born as a white settler to this land of, of immigrant refugee parents, uh, economic refugees across time. Um, and Sekna came because she had to, um, from a refugee kind of experience. And so, uh, and she's a person of color, and I'm a white settler. So we have different accountabilities to the territories we're on. Refugees have to be here, right? And so there's a different set of accountabilities that are required. Um, and so we're trying to figure out what the protocols are for, for us to be here. Um, and for me, um, I, I think that there are some extra ways those of us who are white settlers need to think. So this isn't for everybody, but for people who are my people. We need to examine the interconnections of colonialism, Eurocentrism, and white supremacy. And for me, these ideas were brought forward by Andrea Smith very beautifully in a book called Conquest, um, which was about 500 years of assault of Mother Earth. And to rape Mother Earth, you've got to rape indigenous women, and it's the same practice. Um, and Edward Said's ideas about Orientalism and Eurocentrism. White supremacy is a very different thing from racism, and I've had many people critique me and say, you know, white supremacy is such a jump. Can't we talk about racism? It's like they're really different things, right? Uh, you know, uh, Racism can be enacted by people of color. There's something about white supremacy as a project and the structures that uphold it that require we actually start to think about what that might mean. And I, I wouldn't define these terms. I try to describe them. We don't have a finger on them because they're slippery bastards, right? There, there's a reason we can't and ought not to define. We want to make enough room, too, to continually encapsulate more of the practices of white supremacy, right? So, um, oh, yeah, stay back there. Slow down, Vicki. <laughs> okay, so here's the questions I ask myself. Um, how am I positioning myself individually and collectively on indigenous territories? How might I act in accord with the protocols of indigenous communities? And the protocols aren't the same everywhere. What are the protocols for the territory I'm on? On whose land I live and on who I work on? How might I hold all my work accountable to colonization, even when I'm working with non-indigenous folks? You know, when we, when we submitted this chapter, the editors wrote back and said, oh, you're obviously work, talking, it's about white supremacy and colonizing, so you must be working with First Nations people. And I was like, and Sek, uh, Sekna was great, she emailed me back and said, these be white people, these be your people, you answer this. <laughs> Fair enough. So I wrote back and said, I try to be de decolonizing because I am a settler on indigenous land, it doesn't matter who I'm talking to. And they're like, no, still confused. And I say, okay, let's try this one. I try to be anti-racist even when there isn't a person of color in the room. Oh, got it. Okay. Uh. Yeah. So it's about we're in new territory together, right? Yeah. So I, I want to be gentle and bring a spirit of um, generosity to that, as James Kelly would say. Um, and how do we as individual practitioners, organizations, and professionals address the colonialism entrenched in the traditions of therapeutic and community practice? You are not going to liberate yourself and get out of this. Right? We're all in this. And how do we actually enact inclusivity, right, and authentic partnerships and not tokenism when we're including indigenous people? How might we strategically name and resist colonialism in interactions with funders and governing bodies? What's our role and ethical obligation as non-indigenous workers in resisting, dismantling, and transforming systematic oppressions that make space for our voices at the tables with funders at the cost of indigenous people and voices? Right? And how are we, all of us, participating overtly, covertly, and unintentionally, or with ethical blindness in the psycholonization of indigenous people, in the ways that perpetrate colonialism and oppression and, and construct indigenous people, families, and communities as unwell, broken, and incapable? I think many people have spoken to that this week. Okay, this week, like it was a week. Social change in doing, social change work. 
are we doing social change work or are we actually doing social control? Are we actually accommodating people to oppression? And Paul Cavell wrote a lovely uh, chapter on this called Social Control or Social Change. And it was in a book by the Insight, the Women of Color Collective, called The Revolution Will Not Be Funded. And it's about the very precarious relationships we have with funders. And um, Andrea Smith, the Native American feminist activist, says, you can't heal your way out of patriarchy. You know, we can and we can and ought to see women one at a time and help them shift their relationships to that stuff. But um, that's not doing enough, is it? Then we throw them back to a colonial violent context. We have to do both, and this is activism. And our professionalism tells us we're not supposed to do this because we're supposed to be neutral and objective. But the reality is, the duty of the witness, when I know this, I must act to actually change the conditions that promote this. And many people across time have talked about, are we actually accommodating people to oppression, or are we actually going to be part of the project of liberating people? And it's a different story. So, you know, here's the kind of questions. Are we accommodating people to individual lives of suffering, or are we taking on the project of changing the social structures that promote oppression? And are we rigorously questioning our possible role in social control and increased surveillance that fall on these over-policed and under-protected folks? Right? And how can we establish trustworthiness when we're not acting as agents of state control and additional surveillance on our society's most disadvantaged people? For example, how do we protect migrant people without status who need our care but who do not trust any government-funded agency to not turn them over to this bloodthirsty government which is willing to turn to send them back to countries where they're going to be executed. Right? How do you, in that context, get a refugee to trust you? What would be required? How could we do that? I don't have an answer for that, right? And how can workers no, how can we hold accountability to funding sources? Are we holding sorry, are we holding accountability to funding sources higher? that accountability to the people that we aim to serve? That's a really important question. Are we accountable to our funders or the folks that we're trying to serve? And if so, how can we resist this? And who's in solidarity? So there's some people who figured some of this out. Let's find each other and talk about this. How can workers and nonprofit organizations participate in accountable ways with funding bodies, especially as funders may restrict critiques of government and social policies, right? And how can we sustain ourselves as workers, organizations, and movements in these messy terrains that we're in? What points of connection give us enough wiggle room to be in these spaces of capitalism and social control and maintain our ability to do dignity and enact our collective ethics? Right? Kathy Richardson's all over that question. In it, behind it. <laughs> while, we hold, how, while we hold on to and work for our shared vision for a just society in the future, how do we continue to enact ethics within flawed systems? How can we know we're not being co-opted or complicit? How do we resist cynicism and continue our struggles to transform the organization and government structures that we work for and in, right? And resisting um, competition as an affront to our solidarity. Yeah. Oh, this is the funding by thing. This is a real book. What do funders want? And look who look who the funder is. It's a white guy with a suit. You know, and look who the guy getting the money is. He's a white guy not in a suit. He's in a sweatshirt. Like it just, <laughs> it's a hard day to be a white guy when you're shown this is all white men are. There's all kinds of white men are doing very different things. Like these are the things that, you know, what do funders want? And why do they want it? You know, this, this kind of shit. How do we resist this? Right? That guy's making a whole lot more money than anybody in this room. So everybody needs to know that. Okay. Um, resisting competition as an affront to our solidarity. The capitalist context of our work requires that we're in competition with each other. We didn't bring it into the room. We didn't smuggle it in. It's the air we breathe, right? Um, as individual workers, organizations for resources. So 30 years, and Will mentioned this yesterday, right? 30 years of Western democracy's relationship to neoliberalism and the dismantling of the, so of the social net has left people with precarious lives. And precarious, precarious lives um, Judith Butler, you like, is anybody hotter than her in terms of, like, just women of bodacious brain? She's a real person. She's amazing, Judith Butler. But uh, she wrote a book called Precarious Lives. And a lot of these ideas are from, like, her writings about that. But also Harsha Walia wrote a book called Undoing Border Imperialism and talking about the precarious lives of refugees and asylum seekers. Do you know that one in three people in prison in Canada right now is an asylum seeker? 
That's what the prison industrial complex is floating on. If you don't even know that, you are being lied about. That would take 10 seconds to say in the news. That's a lie. That's the, they're doing a lot of work to not let you believe. Because they've criminalized everybody's telling you that. That's what we mean by precarious lies, right? Um, so, um, and there's this myth about a scarcity of resources. There's not a scarcity of resources. The army isn't having a bake sale to buy their latest weapon to kill people. They're not. And we're, you know, in the women's movement, in 2002, the provincial government got rid of 100% of funding to rape crisis centers and haven't returned a dime, right? It's a myth that there's a scarcity of funding because there's unlimited resources for corporations, what we call corporate welfare, right? And corporations that pay no taxes, militarization. We are the most policed nation in the, in the democratic world. Did you know that? You have more independent police forces here. The SkyTrain police in Vancouver have guns. And what they do is apprehend illegal aliens. It's about transportation, not deportation, is the, is the campaign that's been in uh, addressing that. Like, what do we need all these police for? And what are we doing, a prison industrial complex, when crime's gone down since 1962, when we ended the death penalty, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to cri criminalize poverty in more locations, right? And now we're criminalizing being a refugee. That's been happening in this country for four or five years. When you arrive, you get put in jail. Only Australia is doing that. The United Nations is pissed at both of us. Most Canadians don't even know we're doing this. My my grandparents were not put in a jail when they landed, right? Yeah. So we need to we need to look at those kind of things. So um, here's some of the things I think about, question myself about with this. What are the impacts of this like gladiatorial discourse of vanquishing opponents that bleed into the world of therapy and social and activist work? How can we reveal this competition for what it is? Right? And resist participating with a competitive and unjust system because that's how the way things are. You know, I need to cut the knees off of the other women's center because we're, we're flying for the same grant, so I've got to show what jerks they are and how they're not doing their job. That's that whole competition thing that we're given to do because it's just the way it is. We don't need to align with this. It's against our, it's against our, our solidarity with each other. How can we hold on to a believed in respect of the work of others? based on an understanding of our collective ethics? How can we create dignifying relationships of respect across organizations and domains of practice with an aim to be of use to the people that we serve, right? It doesn't, it's not helpful for me to think all mental health workers, like Robin was saying, I'm a real psychiatrist. And someone said, you're not a real psychiatrist. He's like, no, I'm a psychiatrist. How do we respect Robin and the pieces of his profession? We call him to do his job and then we accuse him of doing his job. How do we be more in solidarity with that and not leave him alone with this spiritual pain of some of the things he's required to do for us because we haven't created a just society that would have better options. But it's not that anybody wants to incarcerate someone. We haven't done, we haven't created the spaces that are not brain surgery to do these kind of things, right? Um, and what are the ways of facilitating a discourse of rigor and critique between practitioners and organizations by way of a reciprocal process? Espousing language that's invitational and reflective accountability. How are we going to start to have some dialogues about the hard territory things without feeling like we're calling each other out? Or throwing someone under the bus or exiling somebody? How do we stay in with each other through the struggle? Um, and how can we resist competition related to funding? How can we prioritize promoting social change and holding the needs of the people we aim to serve at the center? What collaborations or solidarity can we offer to other workers and organizations as we resist disrespectful competition that requires we denigrate the work and reputations of others, right? That diminishes their ability to be of use. Okay, and problematizing the role of academia and justice doing. There's a tenuous relationship between academia and therapy and community work. It's strained in many intersections, particularly in the use of academic research for oppression and imperialist aims, right? There's the militarization of the universities and the oppressive barriers that keep many people and voices out of academia and therefore out of our professions, right? So for example, therapeutic research um, that happened in um, psychology departments is what was used to create this, the practices of torture. And Naomi Klein lays this out in the shock doctrine. And those were Southern Ontario universities, those weren't in the United States. Members of the American Psychological Association took billions of dollars to set up the torture that happened in Guantanamo Bay. And what they're trying to replicate in torture is psychosis. They're very interested in what Robin Rutledge would know because that's what they want to replicate, which is this idea that if you are, if you were right beside me and you were screaming for help, I wouldn't help you. 
that's what psych, quote psychosis looks like. They're getting really interested in that because that's what they want you to feel when they torture you. It's the dismantling of character. It's the dehumanizing of a person. And psychology is intrinsically linked to the technologies of torture. It, that's a point of fact, right? This is what's happening in universities. So, you know, we're parts of these kind of things, right? Um, and I want to read this from um, Linda Tohuai Smith. This is a university in um, uh, Holland. Yeah. So, um, where these, these are, I think these are actually props. <laughs> Great. Um, but here's what Linda Tohuai Smith says about scholarship and Eurocentric scholarship, right? Research is probably one of the dirtiest words in the indigenous world's vocabulary. It stirs up silence, it conjures up bad memories, it raises a smile that is knowing and distrustful. The ways in which scientific research is implicated in the worst excesses of colonialism remains a powerful remembered history for many of the world's colonized people. It's a history that still offends the deeper sense of our humanity. So anytime we engage in research, we need to listen to that. No matter if we're, quote, researching indigenous people or not, are we practicing in some way in ways that are doing, uh, that are going against what we're doing, which is dignity, right? And access to academia continues to be denied around domains of class and race and other locations of oppression, which means that as academics, we participate in systems that perpetrate unjust systemic privilege and that we're complicit in the absence of people with less privilege. While activism can get social justice issues on the agenda of the academy and the professions, the response is often either dismissive of direct action activism or can risk fetishizing some actions invisibilizing others and can replicate patriarchy and privilege. So Jeff Shantz, who's a Canadian criminologist, challenges the criminalization of certain kinds of resistance and resistance by certain classes of people. So the exact same act but by a different class of people is criminalized, right? Um, so Shantz stresses the importance of resisting labeling or understanding acts of resistance as poor behavior at best and mental illness at worst. And he suggests these acts be taken for what they are, political acts. And this, of course, requires making a break with assumptions of privileged forms of resistance and you know, our preconceived notions about activism, right? And um, somebody was talking about Scott. Oh, that didn't come up. Okay. Oh, well, this is it. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, what Scott said, um, is that most social change requires civil unrest. And one of the things that James Scott is questioning for himself is, are those of us who are in the academy, are we actually participating in promoting the criminalization of dissent? Because it's our ideas and our DSM-5 and stuff that's used to criminalize and pathologize people who are causing dissent. And if we really believe in social justice in the academy, things are going to get dirty. Things are going to be messy. Change isn't going to come from a letter writing campaign. It's a strategy. It's a tactic. But things are going to get messy, and most folks who are in academia have got it not really messy, messy lives. And so it's the folks who have these precarious lives who are going to be doing civil unrest, and is the academy going to be part of criminalizing that? And we need to really think, I think about that seriously. Am I complicit in actually pathologizing um, some of the resistance of other folks? Um, complicit in pathologizing and supporting the criminalization of dissent? You know how we've got activism equals terrorism in corporate media? You know, we need to disrupt these languages, right? And also uh, criminalizing resistance and other responses to oppression, despite our claims to the fact that we're about justice doing. So, um, and despite our social justice-oriented intention as educators, we are cautioned by Foucault, and that's a quote, that a relation of surveillance defined and regulated is inscribed at the heart of the practice of teaching. It's not an additional or an adjunct part, but as a mechanism that is inherent to it in which increases its efficiency. So we can't dismiss this critique of and cautioning towards our access to power as teachers. We're also required to respond to being positioned with the normalizing gaze of surveillance as we're positioned to judge who will succeed in academia and who will be welcomed into our professions. So while students from more diverse social locations are forging their ways into classrooms, the faculties are significantly less diverse. Right? And then their students. And keeping power, keeping the power to decide who gets to enter the profession, who's elevated, who's dismissed, keeping that power in our hands. So these are some of the questions uh, to invite a critique of our participation and possible resistance to the transformation of academia. I wrote this before our conversation, Linda Coates, but you're all over this. So these are things we need to. How do we resist seeing students being positioned as consumers? This is a conversation we were having. 
and ourselves as teachers providing a commodity that's been paid for. Because we can lose sight of our ethical obligation as teachers to hold both ourselves and our students accountable to future clients. There are folks who shouldn't be therapists. And if they're paying their money so they're going to get their degree, then we've got, to, we're, we've got to not be complicit in that, right? And that's, you know, we have to take on things structurally to do that. It's not on a couple of brave props. We have to structurally do that. How do we hold ourselves, our faculties, and our academic institutions accountable for the disappearance and silence voices of students who cannot access academia because of various oppressive barriers, including race, class, ableism, colonization? And how do we bridge the chasm of difference and privilege that are barriers to many students fully participating, succeeding, or even surviving academia? Sekna was really clear. There are people who don't survive academia. They die by what gets called suicide. This really happens to some folks. How do we as teachers and faculties and academic institutions make space for students with different cultural knowledges and languages and histories of education? So whose voices are missing in these institutions, in the faculties and in the student body? Without replicating tokenism, how do we resist and transform academia and professionalism to make authentic space for multiple silent voices to be heard? As, as Freire says, it's not enough for voices to be heard. They must also not be able to be dismissed, and they must be responded to. So how as teachers and faculties and academic institutions do we address our power accountably and not invisibilize it or hide behind institutional policy? What keeps us accountable to the circulation of, of power with students not familiar with mainstream institutions? What keeps us accountable to students harmed by education students, such as indigenous people with the legacy of residential schools, or queer and gender variant students who um, suffered violence in ac academic institutions who didn't prioritize their safety and just named it bullying, and never named the transphobia or the homophobia behind that, and the structural part, and instead did the very Canadian thing and figured out who was the bully and taking them out and punishing them which just serves to let the problem, which is the structural violence, uh, sit. Vygotsky teaches that uh, learning is social and it's a relational project, and I like that. So how do we hold on to knowledge that's horizontal and relational while we're positioned in hierarchical structures of power and surveillance, right? So, um, where is I? oh, now we give you James Scott. I'm. I mean, these questions are not questions that I can answer. These are recursive questions. I mean, there's some hopefully will fall off the table as we get our social justice practices together. They'll seem less relevant, uh, and other things will come to the fore. Our privileges are always being unmasked and made made aware to us, usually, for, from my perspective, from transgressing others. It's when I transgress against somebody, I found out what it is I've done as oppressive, and then I have to learn something. So it's, it's never a neutral project to learn these things. It's always on the back of folks who have who are situated with less power. And that's the dirty work that we're in. We're not innocent. And it, the work we do isn't clean. It's not possible to be. But how do we like embrace this kind of messiness together with each other? Um, and for me, you know, this hopeful skepticism, I hold it really close about my own practice, about my collective practice, about my community of practitioners. Um, so my hope is that this critical investigation into our ethical stances for justice doing in our collective work unsettles our complicity and renews an ongoing commitment to work with intention and accountability. We want to unsettle a sense of normalcy or, quote, professional competency. You know, where you're, check, okay, I don't need clinical supervision, I got my RCC, it's like, oh, perfect. You know, we hit competency and so we stop questioning. Um, and Alan was telling me in Sweden, I believe, you have to have clinical supervision or you can't re-register. Wow, you know, wow, just that, what would it, how hard would it be for us to get that here? We just need to demand this of our registering bodies, right? So, and how do we embrace this, this accountability? Um, and how do we embrace discomfort that's necessary for an ongoing invitation to a hopeful skepticism that invites us to rigorously critique the claims to ethics that we hold? We haven't delivered on a just society. We can't envision what doing justice would actually look like. That's from Chomsky. It's my, my PhD, one of my critiques was, you haven't defined social justice. I was like, hell no. You can't, defining it locks it. We couldn't, I wouldn't recognize it if it bit me on the ass. We haven't been, we don't, you know, we can't, we have imaginings. And hopefully our children and our children's children will have bigger and wider frames of these imaginings. But we haven't delivered on a just society, so we can't define it. But we do have dreams and we can describe it, right? And it, it just, it fills my heart to think about that. It's, um, it's a worthwhile project. 
it's hard and it's flawed, right? But how do we join together and stay with each other, especially when we transgress against each other in moments? How do we stay in solidarity across time collectively, right? And in these, you know, in these beautiful partnerships of solidarity, um, where we actually walk the talk and we have believable ethic ethical stances that are decolonizing and anti-oppressive that we actually enact. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm.